by way of an introduction to the 1718 trend predictions, I'd like to show you a video that brings all of this year's 12 food and beverage mega trends to life. Here we go. The world of food and drink and the forces that impact upon it are evolving at pace. So keeping at the forefront of trends is more relevant than ever before. At The Food People, we've used powerful trends analysis sourced from across our unique global trends network to define a trends framework for 2017 to 18. From eight macro-cultural trends, 12 food and drink mega trends with over a hundred sub-trend manifestations. As we take you through this trend framework, think about what it means for your brand, business or innovation pipeline. Getting involved. Did your mother ever tell you not to play with your food? Well, now you can. Diners are becoming increasingly more involved with the creation of their food and their dining experience. Whether in the comfort of their own kitchen with chef -y equipment and meal kits galore, or out in restaurants where they can absorb themselves in part of the creative process. Postmodernist. This is a new era in food, a new movement that blurs the lines between what's possible and what's fantasy. Nouvelle cuisines are emerging, hybrids continue to evolve and adapt, and chefs are collaborating on joint ventures with each other and other brands. Food truly has become post-modernist. Service polarization. The popularity of carefree and casual eating is finally getting some competition from the classical school of fine dining. With a line drawn in the sand, consumers want both a stripped back, laid back affair, as well as indulging in some of the finer sides of fine dining. With this fine dining resurgence, we see a return to traditional service styles. People's revolution. The power is with the people as consumers are deciding exactly when and how they eat and drink. Brands are stretching to all day offerings to satisfy our on the go eating and food delivery companies are growing and expanding to suit our whatever, whenever mentality. All the world's a stage. Lights, camera, action. Our culinary adventures are going beyond simply eating and drinking to encompass the theatre of dining and the multi-sensory experiences available to us. The colour, the look, the texture and the sensory layering of smells, flavours and ingredients allow for us to truly eat our food with all our senses. King of the Carbs After their recent demonisation, carbs are back on the menu and we couldn't be more pleased. The comfort of carbs is returning and we're embracing a new era in bread and pasta as well as a return to century-old processes and craftsmanship behind the production of these two favourites. Soothing comforts. This is all about food as a comfort blanket, offering security, safety and familiarity. Our favourite brands are coming out to play and we're letting our hair down with the most indulgent and over-the-top gluttonous treats, all in the name of comfort, of course. Ethical eating. Conscientious eating has become a large part of the human psyche, with consumers choosing to eat produce that has been reared and grown ethically, whilst also opting to eat in restaurants that look after their staff and food producers. Once upon a time. It's story time like never before, as consumers continue to expect tales, meaning and a personal connection behind their food. The backstory is coming to the front. People's inquisitive nature about the food and drink they consume is driving a trend for seasonality, provenance and details about the equipment and the techniques being used. Wellness your way. People all over the world from different demographics and ages are prioritising their health and wellness choosing better for you foodstuffs and treats, as well as looking to lifestyle health gurus for advice and tips. Wellness is the buzzword of the moment, 
a lifestyle that encompasses more than simply what you eat, but how you live, look and feel from the inside out. Health is the new wealth. In a world where wellness is paramount and exclusion diets are the norm, health truly is becoming the new wealth. Consumers are privy to so much more information about their own health and the nutritional content of food and drink that they're making much more informed decisions about how they want to eat and live. Revamping the run of the mill. This is about making every meal opportunity special, something to write home about. Raising our everyday favourites to heady heights, whether that be by injecting some pizzazz into our water or defrosting that cheap and nasty image of frozen foods. We want our food and we want it good. We hope you found this introduction to the food and drinks trends for 2017 to 2018 inspirational and informative. To deep dive further into the trends most relevant to your brand or business, visit thefoodpeople.co.uk. So here it is, the food and beverage trends map for 17, 18, 12 food and beverage mega trends this year with over 100 plus sub trends. In addition to the 12 food and beverage megatrends, we've also deep dive even further this year into the social and cultural meaning behind those megatrends. We've undertaken a global semiotic study to look at the visual cues, the social and cultural clues, so that we can understand better the why behind what's happening in the world of food and drink. I'm going to concentrate on the food and beverage megatrends themselves, and Amelia, who's speaking directly after me, is going to give you that cultural and meaning insight as well, or at least a taster into it. So the first food and beverage megatrend, I'm sure like me as a kid, you were told that you were not allowed to touch, to talk, to interact with your food. Well, this megatrend is the complete antithesis to that, um, that thought. This is all about getting involved, making choices, participating in your food and drink. Subtrends such as diner participation, meal kits, the returning of uh, bring your own drinks in some cases as well, and us all wanting to be a little bit of the chef at home. And who can refuse the delights of a meal kit? Their popularity probably lies in the comfort of having the exact ingredients, the method spelt out, the direct instructions, and a very clear outcome. We expect to see much more from meal kits over the next couple of years. Being driven by tech-savvy millennials who are pushing innovation in meal kits, they desire to explore their own kitchen but want a little bit of assistance along the way as well. And the Oaxaca example, the, Oaxaca, the recent launch of the Oaxaca meal kits is a really good example of that. And the comfort of having um, a little bit of everything weighed out and the, and the method and the inspiration there is also moving into the world of retail stores and store formats. Builder and de Klerk is a really good example of this, a grocery store in Amsterdam where it's all about convenience for the, for the customer. There are 14 delicious recipes that rotate on a weekly basis. All of the ingredients are pre-portioned in portions for one, so there's no food waste uh, at home at all. Most of the ingredients in this case are also uh, local and organic. Very simple proposition. Um, the meals are prepared in under 30 minutes and then around the store you've got fantastic breads and wines and so on. If you haven't been or seen it, it's worth having a look at it. Now, we mentioned this, this one last year and the reason for the mention again, this whole delivery kits thing, is that it's very much in growth. Something that started in Sweden a few years ago is now a $1 billion business. Um, and that's predicted to grow to 5 billion in 10 years, driven by exponential growth in the UK, EU, and US, as well as the brands that we know, Blue Ribbon, HelloFresh, Plated, Gusto. We're also seeing diversification in this space as well. And this proposition, Purple Carrot, is quite an interesting one. This comes with all of the convenience, the inspiration, but in this case, a vegan proposition. Next, I want to talk about diner participation. I'll show you a short video from the new open, the hot pot opening called Shuang Shuang in London.
Hot pot is basically cook your own food, similar to fondue, but instead of deep frying greasy oil, you boil in a broth, and you have ingredients, and you have dipping sauce. Hot pot for me, it's my life experience. At each stage of my life, it played different parts. When I was young, I had hot pot with my family. When you eat it with your friends or siblings, you have to be careful who will steal your ingredients. So you have to guard them. Don't, don't keep your eye out, otherwise you, your ingredient will be gone. Imagine five-year-old boy cooking your own food. It's really fun. But when I grow up to become a teenager, every exam, we always go up to celebrate the holiday at Hot Pot restaurant. And when I was in a college, after a big night out, everyone will come to a Hot Pot just with a massive big headache. Just try to eat the broth to comfort your own body. It's just such a big part in our culture. So diners are seeking interaction, connection with their culinary experiences as food has become so much more than just simply food itself. No longer is it acceptable for restaurants just to simply serve. They must involve, they must engage. And this is particularly true at the other end of the dining uh, spectrum as well, where we see this growth of what I would call one, two, three restaurants, where you would um, choose an X ingredient, add a Y ingredient, and then finish it with another ingredient on top of that. That is starting to become um, ubiquitous, very much uh, on every street corner. We're seeing this one, two, three concept, which is perhaps becoming a little fatiguing. Obviously, one format that I wouldn't say is fatiguing is shuang shuang. Next, in terms of diner participation, a really interesting concept from IKEA, their new dining club. So it's a DIY supper club where you get to play chef for the evening. You get to cook for your family and your friends, perhaps for a birthday or indeed a, uh, another celebration, but all under the watchful eye of a Swedish chef and of course a stylish IKEA kitchen as well. But everybody gets to reconnect and socialize uh, around, around food. The next mega trend to touch on is one that we've called postmodernist. This is all about food in the new era. We've had Nouvelle, we've had Abundant Comfort, we've had Molecular, we've now got Postmodernist. There are elements, or these are the elements, I should say, that are at the very forefront of a new era in permissibility in food and drink, where the lines are redrawn and the boundaries recut, and food and drink has truly become postmodernist. Some of the sub-trends that we see in this particular space, things like experimental tea, fifth generation coffee, sweet and savory blurred and vice versa more food on sticks more food and drink collaborations as well as hybrid but the first one that i want to start with is the vegetable revolution and it is most definitely in full swing ladies and gentlemen there are a whole host of reasons why greens and roots are becoming the center please how we think about vegetables uh, has been changing and is continuing to change as we look into the future. No longer left to the side of plates, very much centre of the action. Um, particularly, pop particularly popular is uh, our sort of borrowing uh, formats and shapes and so on from the world of meat. 
So we, uh, and, and other carbohydrates, so vegetable ribbons, cauliflower steaks, veet balls, and vegetable carpaccios. When we look at our menu analytics, 2014 to 15, we see a 100 plus percent increase in vegetable-centric main courses, and this looks like it's continuing into 2016. Phenomenal numbers of restaurants are now serving, choosing to serve vegetables over meat. A mirroring of the single specialism that we see in the world of meat-based restaurants, we now see chefs concentrating their efforts on vegetables only, or indeed vegetable-centric cuisine. A really lovely example of this is uh, Ethos uh, here, with their strapline deliciously different. But this isn't just about the world of restaurants, this is also about the world of retail as well. Um, and this is a really lo lovely example from Toronto called Yam Chop. Get it? Yam Chop. Another really good example, um, the vegetable butcher in The Hague, um, helping customers to think differently about vegetables, preparing them in different ways, inspiring them to use vegetables um, as meat replacers. And many of you will know, last year we were at uh, Grain Store uh, with Bruno Lube but another one of many hundreds of chefs that we're hearing about around the world who are getting exciting about vegetables is a guy called Aaron London from Owl's Place in San Francisco. And here's his take on vegetable-centric cuisine. This guy's got the best peaches. Uh, I'm thinking as much peaches as uh, you'll let me have today. We're going to use some for a uh, stone-free curry we're making right now. And uh, we're also doing a roasted peach dessert right now. So kind of all over the place. I didn't really get to think about the food until about a week before we opened. Uh, it was really pretty scary. And so when I uh, did get to that week and did have that chance to kind of like reflect and look at like, you know, what I wanted the food to be, I had to kind of sit down and like kind of question myself. What do I think about vegetables? What do I think about meat? What do I think about fish? How should they be represented on the menu? So I kind of thought about uh, vegetables. I'm like, All right, well, how do I think about vegetables? How do I like them? Um, I think they're very complex. I think that there's like a world of opportunity of what you can do with them. It's never ending. I, I'm set with this, but I need to get a ton of uh, tomatoes. About 30 pounds, so probably like around three flats. Yeah, can I come back there and take a look? Okay, those guys are obviously a star. I know that right off the bat. And when I say vegetables, I mean, you know, produce in general, fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, all, all this jazz. Vegetables is the core, a little bit of like fish in intermingled, and then meat on the side. And as like I thought that through, I was like, no, actually I should call meat literally side. It, it really, really is a good way to eat a ton of vegetables and grains, you know, and have a little bit of meat as well to enjoy. For both the reason on how I feel like they should be eaten, and also to make a little bit of a statement of how I like to eat. Alright, so here you go. We use every part of everything. So if we bring in like a vegetable or a fruit or everything, we're using like the seeds and the pulp and the skin and the pith and the stem and the everything. When I write the menu, I don't think of it as like, okay, I need a Thai thing here and a French thing there and an Italian thing there and a yada yada yada. I'm not trying to construct this like multicultural thing necessarily. It's happening naturally because all of those like filters, like the, you know, the filter I learned when I was in Italy and the filter I learned when cooking in France and the filter I learned uh, cooking in uh, Thailand, they're all in there. It's by sitting there and using every part of the ingredient and then like basically pulling the ingredient apart and pushing that flavor back inside the ingredient that you get these layered extra flavors. People before we opened asking what kind of restaurant it's going to be, people still asking what kind of restaurant it is. Here, I mean, the food is Al's Place food. Any of you get the opportunity to go, it's well worth uh, a visit. But a something we see a lot closer to home is this world of hybrid and we couldn't talk about postmodernists without talking about hybrid. Um, and this world of hybrid is holding a very powerful sway with consumers, with our need for novelty, an appetite for everything new, bold, daring, and interesting. This is all about clashing tastes, colors, food formats, cuisines, textures, and giving it a right good shake-up. We've abolished the rules, and now we're making way for a new era in creativity and originality. As we know, this was started in 2013 by Dominic Ansel with the Cronut, and I have to admit that we would have said that this was a fad in 2013. But what that has unleashed globally is this permissibility to do things different, and we see this now in sweet and savory, uh, in food formats, cuisines, retail formats, and so on. And this guy, who is now in London with his pop-up, was the catalyst to this. Uh, we're also seeing the fifth generation coffee as well. So first generation all about growing coffee consumption globally. The second about defining the enjoyment of speciality coffee. The third purchasing coffee based on its origin. And the fourth 
about sharing knowledge about coffee and individuals. And the fifth, this is all about new techniques for serving. So we're seeing um, things popping up in uh, coffee, popping up in cocktails, high quality nitro cans and also draft, bullet coffees as well, uh, convenient uh, liquid coffee concentrates and also provenance coming through in dry coffee formats as well. And Sudden is a really nice example of that, where they're introducing provenance and backstory and premiumization to the world of instant coffee. But it's not just about coffee, it's also about tea. Expect to see carbonated versions. Teas as the main ingredient as cocktails. Um, and the takeover of cold brew, cold brew in um, new and interesting varieties of iced tea. Yes, black tea, um, we're seeing a decline in sales, but that's more than made up for the giant popularity of, of alternatives such as matcha, which remains uh, unmatched in terms of its trend. Um, hot on the heels of Japan's most favorite tea, though, we've got things like uh, kelp tea, roasted barley tea, buckwheat tea. A couple of examples there. Owl's brew there on the right-hand side, which is a tea specifically brewed for use in cocktails, and then EBT, a 16-hour cold brew there on the left-hand side. So now let's talk people revolution. And there is a revolution happening out there in food and drink, consumers breaking norms and traditions. The power is with the people as they decide now how and when they consume food and drink. A blurring of channel diversification, pop-ups, deliveries, route to markets being turned on their heads. We're sharing, snacking, personalizing even more than ever before. The sheer scope of food service and retail channels is necessitating vast opportunities for channel swapping and boundary blurring, so much so that we don't know where the boundaries are anymore. No longer is it uncommon to find a bakery popping up in a coffee shop, to find uh, a restaurant with a cinema attached for that ultimate date night experience. Examples, high street examples. Carlichos having a play with an on-the-go format, Pretz moving and experimenting with different day parts, and of course on the right-hand side there, the laundromat cafe, the laundry and cafe and bakery all in one spot. Why wouldn't you? Other examples, Moleskin, better known for their leather bound books, also moving into breakfast, lunch and dinner, more blurring and boundary swapping. And whilst we've got hundreds of examples of chefs diversifying and finding new ways with vegetables, there's a backlash to that. Meat, butcher to, butcher's block to table. This is all about glorifying meat, marrying uh, an artisan butcher shop to a restaurant, creating a wow for consumers uh, with an up-close experience of nose-to-tail butchery. On the left-hand side, a really lovely example from Parts and Labour, which is in Baltimore, where you've got the, the fire kitchen there at the top, the counter, bottom left, an example of one of the dishes there, and much closer to home, Hill and Zork, from uh, London Fields, not too far away from here. Also, in this channel revolution, we've got Kellogg's um, with their new cafe in New York City, so you can indulge in your favorite breakfast cereal any time of the day. And whilst we're talking about breakfast cereals, we have to talk about the, all the Bs. We're talking about breakfast, brunch, and Brinner, so Brinner as dinner. Something that we mentioned last year, but one that we're seeing gaining real traction. The breakfast trend is really evolving into an all-day affair that continues to see brunch take center stage, a day part that you most definitely want to be seen to be involved in, particularly at the weekend. And the love for breakfast continues right up until and past dinner time as well, where perhaps you're having a big bowl of granola or a breakfast taco, photographing it and hashtagging it with Brenner. And McDonald's have discovered the virtues of all-day breakfast, and we've seen their competitors react to that globally. We've seen Starbucks spice up their breakfast offer both in the US and the UK. Even more exciting, though, we've got different textures at breakfast time. Breakfast was all about smooth and soft. We've, we've got other much more interesting crunchy textures going on at breakfast time as well. Crispy chorizo, chimichurri, uh, coarse whole grain cereal. Breakfast sandwiches also are making waves with uh, millennials as we demand high protein and portability in one, uh, in one particular package. And then who couldn't resist the offer there on the left hand side from Egg Slut. The Wago tri-tip, runny egg over, chimichurri, red onions and rocket on brioche. I don't think we've got that on the lunch menu. Right. Also to mention in this particular space, we've got um, delivery. And 
last year we mentioned the sort of unparalleled rise of the third party companies, the likes of Deliveroo and, uh, and uh, Uber Eats. And again, the reason for the mention is that this continues to grow at some pace. We were speaking to a casual dining chain uh, over the last few weeks who said that they've seen a zero to four million pounds incremental increase in sales from Deliveroo in two years, which is staggering. There's also an interesting sub-trend happening in this space as well. We've got e-startups um, in the US, and we've now got them in the UK as well, where they're assembling networks of home cooks to prepare meals and deliver them to other people's homes. Tr um, Tribe is one in London um, that we're seeing starting up at the moment. So that's a, pl a platform for home delivery cooks to prepare their meals for hungry locals in their area. And of course, in this space, we have to talk about sharing. Our appetite to share continues to grow. We've seen a 280% increase, 14 to 15, in sharing language on menus. Terms like to share, sharing platters, family style, tapa style. There's something about sharing that taps into the sort of communal function of food. But then we realize that it's not just the food that, that we're sharing, but but an experience, it's, a, it's all about a social interaction. Really nice example there from Barbary in London as well. Uh, and we're seeing the rise of what we call the third space. So increasingly we're seeing a revolution in new spaces to eat and drink. Food halls, food courts, pop-up food markets are, became, are becoming our new restaurants, multifaceted currently culinary experiences. On the left-hand side there, a pergola on the roof, which was a pop-up over the summer, and there's a new one just about to open uh, for the winter season as well, where you've got more than one restaurant um, in, a, in, a, in a dining space around communal, uh, communal uh, seating space. And there on, on the right-hand side there, the farm shop at the uh, Gloucester Services on the M5, completely revolutionizing the world of um, motorway services. Within this uh, particular mega trend as well, we've got the great snackification. When we look actually at time allocation, we're actually spending more of our day snacking than we are eating the conventional three meals a day. We're living in an age of snackification and modern daily lives demand good quality, inspirational, um, day part relevant grazing on the go. It's a $94 billion industry and it's continually growing. There's a clear demand for high quality snack foods that deliver taste, convenience and nutrition, which has been, been um, driven largely by millennials. 35% of millennials are using snack, snacks as meal replacements, and this generation are demanding better snacking uh, alternatives. Snacks are shifting from sweet to savoury, and although they need to offer satiety, um, you know, nutrients and high protein, taste is absolutely uh, front and foremost in many of the propositions that we see. A couple of sub-trends within great snackification, we've got the premium, uh, premium meat snacking, so um, propositions like Serious Pig and Epic, and we're seeing more of those, not only in the UK, but in different parts of the world as well. And the Sargento Balanced Breaks product, which is a, a cheese and fruit and nut um, badge protein, portion controlled snack pack there on the right hand side as well. The next mega trend to mention is one that we've called Soothing Comfort. So this is all about food and drink spanning sweet and savoury. That represents security, safety, fun, familiarity and a splash of gluttonous sentimentality. Not new as a megatrend, but one very much with staying power and particularly relevant uh, in the evolving geopolitical world with, in which we find ourselves. And these two images for me typify soothing comfort. So we've got the fab cocktail there on the left hand side. Anybody remember the fab lollies? You can still get them. Um, the different flavors, the vanilla, the fruit, the hundreds and thousands for the texture. This is a childhood classic that's been adultized in this case in the form of a cocktail. It's fun, it'll make you stop and smile, and who could possibly resist the one on the right hand side there, the sourdough toasty. It's comfort, it's carby, it's eggy, it's runny and cheesy, it's a poshed up cheese toasty. It is everything that gluttonous comfort stands for. Next, we have a bit of service polarization going on. Casual dining, absolutely a food genre that is here to stay, not going anywhere. Um, but what we are seeing is a return to the skill and art and service in a, in a post-modern context. So we are still uh, packing up the silverware. 
kicking back and relaxing. Casualization in, in our dining scene is very much here to stay. That doesn't go anywhere. Driven by street food, driven by fashion, driven by the fact that great food is now, um, is now cheap and it's accessible to everybody. Big name chefs are still diversifying into this particular area. Um, really a couple of great examples. You've got dip and flip there on the uh, bottom left. So you've got a double cheeseburger top with roast beef, you've got a dip on the side um, with all of the delicious juices that go with that. And then on the right hand side, an example that we picked up from Holland, Frites Atelier. So this is about gourmet, uh, gourmet fries um, in Amsterdam. It's driven by uh, a guy called Sergio Herman, who's a three Michelin star chef in Holland. We're also seeing this gourmetization of fries, not only in the US, which is an obvious one, but also France and a lot of them in the Middle East as well. And we're seeing a return to service, skill, and style. So this is all about the importance of skill, craftsmanship, with elements of experience and personalization. And it wasn't that long ago, if you went to any dining experience, there was no at-table theater at all. And what we're seeing is an increase in examples of service coming back to the table in quite a classical style. So the example there, Petit Pois on the left-hand side, where you've got the chocolate dessert spoon directly from the bowl onto the plate. Um, and then Elevenbridge and also Ma uh, Marcialo, um, which is Italian for butcher in the UK, but is an Italian chain, which is all about the provenance and heritage and quality of meat, but it's brought to the table, sliced and served in front of you. Then the next mega trend we have, <laughs> revamping run of the mill, making every meal opportunity special with something to write home about, raising our everyday favorites to heady heights, whether that be pimping our favorite meals, injecting some pizzazz into water even, or deep frosting the cheap and nasty image of frozen food. And the first one um, to start off with is pimped every day. This is about making every day special, ensuring that every meal occasion can be exceptional. Our weekday staples are getting a smack of snobbery. Truffle is leading the way, appearing on burgers, fries, pizzas. Meanwhile, lobster rolls are becoming a staple food. Our love of classics, things like mac and cheese, are getting glammed up with the, the likes of um, crab or indeed uh, specialist cheese with provenance, or even croissants with uh, gold leaf. Splash of rainbow color on your latte. Really, everyday food does not need in any way to be drab. And also within this mega trend, we've got one that we've called veggie dude food. So dude food, something we've talked about a couple of years ago, but we're starting to see this move into the world of vegetables, which is really exciting. Messy, mucky, full-on flavor this is all about. Loaded, indulgent dude food. Um, we're seeing many in many different places, but we're seeing this now transfer into the world of vegetables. So think vegetable fritters, vegetable tots, wedges, vegetable popcorn, southern fried tempura vegetables, veet balls and burgers. There really is no end, no end to... Um, what's happening in this vegetable dude food space. There's also a spotlight on water. Going back to the simplicity of water with a whole array of different regional offerings from a water perspective, each with their own specific characteristics. We're seeing it was once novelty, but now we're seeing uh, increasing numbers of water sommeliers, water menus, tree waters as consumers look to the basic HTO for the most nat as the most natural and hydrating of all the vegetables. Uh, uh, beverages, I should say. Low in calories and low in sugar compared to many other drinks that are available. This is a big push from every, for everyone to rehydrate with water, especially kids as well. And then we have all the world's a stage. Our culinary adventures are most definitely going multi-sensory. Colors, the taste, the textures are all being notched up in our food and drink to deliver experience that you will really remember. Some of the sub-trends that we see in this space, things like um, sensory styling, sour drinks, flowers, fermentation, as well as size distortion, fizz and fire cooking. But a few that I would like to focus on. The first is theater. So food, drink, shopping has entered this new world of theater with retail, restaurants, barmen and chefs proudly showing off their kitchens, breaking down boundaries. We're now much closer to our food and drink than we've ever been before. Barriers are being removed, waiters are serving, carving at tables, all the things that we've talked about. Food interactions are becoming more individualized through a greater proximity to the action. And 
Harvard did a really interesting study last year and set up three different uh, kitchen scenarios. One, a completely closed kitchen, one, a uh, completely open kitchen, and one where the chefs could see the diners only. And what was really interesting is at the end of the meal experience, they surveyed everybody uh, and asked them what their perception of the food quality was. Well, those were the, in the total open kitchen uh, and restaurant dining environment, 17.3% 17 increase in perceived food quality. But what was also interesting is when the chefs could see the diners, but not vice versa, there was also a 10% increase in food quality perception as well. So it does work both ways. So there's a lot more theatre, we're getting a lot closer. And a really lovely example of this um, is something that we spotted recently in the Los Angeles uh, Grand Market, Mark Peel's Bombo, which is a seafood concession um, where it's, everything is cooked a la minute in steam jacketed vessels. Really interesting concept. And this, these interactions that we're having with food are also moving on the go. You'll remember last year that we spoke, spoke about bowl food, where we eat with our hands, where we have a more uh, intimate interaction with our food and drink. We're now seeing entire bowl sections on menus. We've seen the trend for one-handed food interaction evolve into box food, pot food, and even jar food that we're going to hear a, a little more from later on. Also within this uh, particular mega trend, we've got Bright is Beautiful. And again, from our plating analytics, we can see that our food is becoming more colorful. We're seeing increased presence of uh, colors such as uh, purple, red, orange, black, and green, and even blue, particularly in uh, the world of desserts um, as well. And Claire will talk a little bit more about that um, later on. So our food is becoming more colorful. And you can see that with the examples on the screen there. Uh, the matcha bun, we're seeing lots of matcha buns, that particular example from the matcha milk bar in Australia, the rainbow sushi there, and uh, a rather virtuous looking uh, banana, mango and green smoothie there on the right hand side as well. We're also seeing much, much more fire cooking. So foams, gels, spheres are all very much out. Charring, burning and smoking is very much still the cooking technique of the moment. Burnt and charred flavours tap into two particular flavour elements that are hot at the moment, so bitterness and also uh, umami. There's something quite primeval, I think, about fire cooking. It takes us back to ancient times, thousands of years ago, when man first cooked on the fire. The resurgence of this, what I think is quite an enchanting but primitive cooking technique, it almost takes us full circle in our culinary quest. The illustration there on the screen is Camino, uh, in Oakland, California, but examples very close to home, Salt Yard, Barbary, and Smokehouse. And then we've got lots and lots and lots of extra sensory additions happening, and it's one that we've talked about before, but I think really, really important for the food industry. There is a need for more. This is what this trend is all about. It's about greater levels of delivery in food and drink, flavor and texture layering. 
it's no longer it's no longer acceptable just to present one dimensional food condiments continue to capture our hearts and imaginations we're seeing powders coatings crusts uh, middles melts all being used to add that extra layer of flavor and texture so the example there on the left left hand side not just a bread roll but a pepper pretzel bread roll with whipped bacon butter and dried bacon bits the top right hand side is a picture we took last week a pork platter that we had at Jinju with a plethora of different sauces sprinkles and additions there lots of sensory layering and textures going on and even at TGI Fridays bottom right hand side there the new revamp concept at Leicester Square with the new hot dog menu sees dogs with multiple sauces sprinkles melts and dressings then we have once upon a time as a mega trend. This is story time like no other. This is the backstory moving very much to the front. With our inquisitive nature about the food and drink that we consume, how it's prepared, who's involved, the why, the locations, the geographies, the breeds and the varieties. Again, we see a triple digit increase in um, backstory naming on menus and we've seen this cross tier from QSR through to high end restaurants. In sub-trends that we see in this space, things like craft, short and simple stories, street, provenance, regional hero, and the small guy, to name but a few. And indeed, small guy is the one that I wanted to start with. Cuckoo, a really good example of that with their Bircher Muesli, the Padstow Brewing Company there on the right-hand side as well. And the power really is with the small guy in a world where consumers are showing a strong preference for independence versus big business, which of course is a challenge for many people in the room. It seems that everyone likes and loves not only the underdog, but the story behind the underdog as well. And then we think on the flip side, a major problem for some of our best known and loved brands, the jingles implanted in all of our minds, um, their brands etched uh, in our uh, very much front of mind for us. But these independent small guys, these pop-ups are causing us um, a challenge but in both emerging and developed markets these new entrepreneurial startups they're more fleet of foot they move quicker they've got a more um, engaging less corporate um, entrepreneurial tone of voice we all love the small guy and of course one of the best possible examples of um, this uh, mega trend is of course the street food trend itself and again not a new one but str this street food um, is very much the king food culture at the moment. It's been gathering momentum for some time now, but its reign shows no sign of abating. Um, it's one that we see starting to transfer into restaurants as well, with chefs adopting many of the principles of the street food world. The simplicity, the transparency, the immediacy, that storytelling by real people. There was a really interesting piece of research done um, last year, which spoke to people visiting street food locations, not just in London, but other parts of the UK as well, remembering that this is a momentum that we see moving outside of our capital cities as well. Remembering 70% of us live in urban environments, and many of those now having some kind of street food or street market or gathering. And the highlights from that particular research were showing that 50% of, uh, of respondents were buying street food more than once a week, 25% of those up to three times a week. 65% spending more than £6.50 on lunch, which is quite a step up from your average lunchtime meal deal. 80% liked the spice and flavour that street food gave them. 68% said that street food had introduced them to new flavours. And just under 90% said that they were planning to eat street food more often. So hence, we thought, as it's most definitely not going away, we'd bring you all to Hawker House this year for our third annual Trends event. But street food is also being premiumized as well. A great example here, Mercado de Ribeira um, from uh, Lisbon. Um, this is street food for the faint-hearted, uh, slightly less gritty. Uh, we've got communal tables down the middle. There's about 30 traders in a U-shape uh, around the outside of the hall. This is a, a concept um, brought to us by uh, Time Out and one that they're planning to bring to London and New York as well. So look out for that. And I just want to talk about health and you'll have noticed from the video that we've broken health down into two mega trends this year so 
As the title of the slide says, two megatrends and three watchwords. So the two megatrends, health is the new wealth. So this is serious health, for the pure virtuous health, for the health aware elite. Then we've got wellness your way, which is much more about fitting health into your life, not the other way around, a more sustainable and perhaps softer approach. Then three watchwords, natural. And this is all about many of the propositions that we see uh, being promoted on the back of health have natural additions. It's about promoting the naturally inherent values that are occurring within the ingredients rather than necessarily fortifying. The second watchword is flexible. So we're in a food and drink era where it's fine to stand up and say, I'm opting into a, a gluten-free diet today or for this week or this month, and then I'm going to try something completely different. So we're taking a much more flexible approach to our health. And the last one is without compromise. So without compromise on flavor, taste, and texture. So the first one then, health is the new wealth. As I said, this is the more virtuous one. It's pure. These are perhaps people that have actual health conditions, eating clean for the health elite. People who are super keen on their health and their diet and perhaps see themselves as almost their own medical practitioners. So we've got vegan, we've got eat clean, free from, we've got gut health, we've got foods that heal and even nootropics as well. And the first one to pick up on is veganism. Veganism has exploded onto our um, plates recently, driven by uh, environmental concerns, a rise of conscious eating, and a greater consideration for health and well-being. The advent of casual vegetarianism, a veganism, sorry, that allows consumers to dip into this lifestyle now and again has ensured that this movement has real lifeblood in it. It's a lifestyle that has long lost its negative connotations of austere, salad-eating extremists and instead becomes, instead becomes something that is actually extremely fashionable. So those to the uh, crusted tofu taco there on the right-hand side looks absolutely uh, delicious. And the one on, the, le on the, the left hand side of the screen there, a vegan freak shake that we spotted recently in Canvas Cafe. And then, of course, we have naturally free from. So gluten free, as we know, remains the largest category uh, within free from. Uh, and it's become a, re a, re a reassuring and welcome message on uh, packs and packaging. Consumers are expecting gluten free options and the industry is most definitely not disappointing. There's an increase in those of us that are taking up the gluten-free uh, diets from a lifestyle perspective, but the numbers, as we've said before, remain, as, from a celiac perspective, remain static. This the trend continues to grow. These health-conscious consumers are looking for bold, bright, and delicious, uh, naturally free from solutions. And whilst gluten-free is at the top of the list, dairy-free is hot on, the, um, hot on the tails of that as well. Again, referencing our menu analytics, a 380% year-on-year increase of gluten-free labelling on menus 2014 to 15. And we recently undertook a menu study in Australia that highlighted that over 10% of all menus in a 4,000 menu item study had some type of allergen labelling. Within this uh, mega trend as well, we also have gut health. So, something that went out of fashion but now is back. We're, still, we're talking again about pre and probiotics, one of the hottest health trends at the moment. So we're becoming more aware of not only what we digest but how we digest it as well. So foods with probiotic supplements or simply rich in probiotic foodstuffs. So we've got the kefir drink from Pure Earth there on the left hand side and also yum butters. I tasted these recently in Whole Foods actually, they were doing a sampling with um, probiotic added cultures. We've also got hydrating and activating, so not by any means mass market, but one that's being talked about a lot in the um, health circles. This is once an ancient tradition practiced by the native people of Central America and Australia, and it's all about hydrating your nuts and seeds um, before you eat them. And this is finding real traction within health conscious communities. The fact that you're soaking or hydrating uh, removes some of the enzyme inhibitors and lowers uh, cytic acid. So it's all about improving macronutrient absorption. That's what this is all about. Then within this megatrend, we also have nootropics. So nootropics are drugs that enhance uh, cognitive performance, particularly memory, motivation, and creativity. I think uh, we could do with a glass of that, yeah. Um, and this, in, from a drug perspective, is a $1 billion industry, but we're starting to see this move into, into food and drink particularly 
uh, ingredients that contain natural nootropic elements. So Tionics there on the left hand side there, um, I've got their I Love My Brain drink and uh, a cough feast, also a caffeine based brain boosting formula. Then we have the mega trend of wellness your way and as I spoke about earlier on this is about flexibility and permissibility in its health form. This is about dabbling with health, it's about dipping in and out, health lifestyles and balance, it's about a nod towards healthier. You can do what you want, not so pure, not so virtuous, it's the sort of soft and sustainable health. And a key element within this is the world of vegetarianism and last year we told you about the survey that Pret did uh, where they asked their customers uh, what they thought of the idea of a veggie pret. Well, that came in the form of a pop-up and it's here to stay with plans to roll out. There's a steady increase in the number of people choosing to avoid meat and embrace a vegetarian diet, with most believing that opting into a meat-free lifestyle or at least a partial meat-free lifestyle in the form of flexitarianism um, will improve their health and weight over time, obviously prompted by uh, celebrities and public figures uh, Vegetarianism and, uh, and flexitarianism has injected a dose of hip and coolness that perhaps wasn't there in this particular space. There's about 2% of um, adult vegetarians in the UK. I've seen figures that suggest that this jumps to 16% of 18 to 24 year olds, with over 26% of adults saying that they have at some point dabbled with a uh, vegetarian um, lifestyle. Um, and the next one that I'd just like to show you is um, mindfulness. Um, something that's gathering really a lot of momentum and a really nice example here of Mindful Chef here in the UK. So mindfulness is becoming a global phenomena. We're seeing in the industry booming with mindfulness courses, apps, and food companies are starting to embrace this particular movement. This is all about uh, a modern world where we want to stop and pause and take, uh, take in the moment. Uh, mindful eating has been touted as one of the best ways to lose or indeed maintain weight. Yes, it, it's not only about what we eat, but also being mindful of others, the environment, the impact our choices have on uh, ourselves and other people as well. We're also replacing and substituting. So this is a growing trend towards uh, replacing or substituting so-called negative ingredients. So things like um, sugar, wheat, or even caffeine. So consumers look to improve their well-being um, by substituting particular ingredients. So we think, see things like um, the IC pasta there on the left-hand side, which is a seaweed-based pasta product. In uh, retailer own label, both in the US and in, in the UK, expect to see more pasta replacing vegetable products, vegetable pasta sheets, um, squash penne as an example, we've seen um, examples of as well. So expect to see a lot more in that space. And lastly, protein enrichment. The rise of protein is not going anywhere as consumers continue to view this macronutrient as king. We've seen a 40% increase in protein claim badging in retail 2014 to 15 in the UK. That is the trends map for 1718, very much a whistle stop tour. There's a hundred plus mega trends for you to get inspired and excited about in your trend books that are coming later on. And just by way of a wrap up, I just wanted to summarize by saying look out for the return of comfort food over the next couple of years. The rise of comfort and security as the world around us becomes more turbulent and potentially the cost of living rises as well. It's very much the demands of the people and not necessarily industry and policy makers that are driving that change. Millennials continue to be a powerful consumer group responsible for a significant shift in changes of demand. The norms are no more and the boundaries are most definitely being broken and your routes to market are being challenged and turned on their head. Vegetable-based eating is gaining real momentum and delicious, enjoyable health is fast becoming the norm. Trends are moving faster than ever. The adoption is increasing with the, with the progression and evolution of social media within society. 
the maintaining relevance to your audience couldn't be more important than it is now. And your competitor today may not be your competitor of tomorrow. And as many of the trends that I've talked about have a, a tech-enabled element, I just wanted to finish with a, um, a very short video. great bit is he even does the washing up as well. Um, so just before I exit stage left, um, food and beverage, the trends books are here, they're in the room. There's a few snaps of them on the screen there for you. Obviously you'll all get a copy to take away. You will need your ticket to redeem that at the end of the day. There will be more of them um, on sale, uh, not necessarily today, but there'll be an email link coming out very, very soon. It contains all of the food and beverage mega trends, the social and cultural trends, cu cuisines, ingredients as well. And it's designed for you to customize. There are lots of note pages in there. We want to see magazine clippings, articles torn out, and you customizing those, popping the pages out to them and using them in workshops, which I know many of you do. That's me, ladies and gentlemen, for now. The food and beverage trends for 2017-18. <laughs>